call his family. He maybe has five days. Maybe. His kidneys are about to fail. He's gonna die. If I can live through this, what comes next will be marvelous. It's not real in my mind to think about having five days to live. That fear that you would have experienced. How do you turn that fear into hope when you're given a diagnosis like that? I don't have time to think about this. Just tell me what is the solution? How has that changed your perspective on life? The whole experience made me realize love and connection is the number one thing. Like everything else became so irrelevant. Welcome back. In today's episode, I sit down with Axel Schurer for a conversation centered on his battle with Burkitt leukemia, a rare, fast-growing type of blood cancer that nearly took his life in 2022. This is a story of a young person who has faced death and survived to share their experience and newfound perspective on life. A story of agonizing pain, suffering, blame, self-responsibility, hope, and happiness. And most importantly, a story of love and connection. Please enjoy. Will be marvelous. Cheers, buddy. Really excited to be here. Yeah, it's been a long, long time coming. And a lot's changed since I think we first maybe chatted about doing a show. A lot. A lot has changed. So also this morning, do you know this iPhone reminder? What you did two years ago? Sometimes I think it's also on Instagram. Uh, two, two, exactly two years ago, I was finishing round five of chemotherapy. Gosh. And I saw pictures of myself, and I know what I look like now and how I feel, and I'm like, that's only two years? Yeah, we, were, we had dinner, dinner the other night, and you were talking about how quickly you lost weight. That yeah. was what really surprised me. I have to look it up if there is a world record. I, I might have good chances because I lost 30 kilograms in the matter of a month. Yeah, and you're a big guy. You're, what, 90 kilograms is kind of where you would sit normally. A yeah. lot of muscle. Yeah. Yeah, that must be a tough thing to watch. Yeah. After all of that hard work, putting so much work into your physical health, then to see that kind of erode, dissolve in such a quick space of time. Honestly, back then when it happened, I didn't care about the way I looked. I just wanted to be healthy. Like I didn't give a damn about my, the size of my biceps. Um, I also knew it's going to come back very quickly because of muscle memory. Um, but honestly, I, I didn't care. But it must be scary though to see that much weight coming off that quickly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's this one clip. I'm going to send it to you. I wa that was the first time I could walk by myself to the toilet. And I'm like, I got to film this. It was hard to look at myself, but I have to film this. One day it's gonna gonna be of use and it's gonna help and it's gonna inspire people. So I took my camera out and I took my shirt off and I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's gonna be a transformation. Um, yeah, I'm glad that you you seem to to document a, a bit of it. I'm not sure how much of it, but but as you say that is very powerful and one thing that i've noticed from sort of watching from afar and looking at how people are engaging with the things that you're sharing it's the visual of the journey that one seems to be it's it's resonating with people there's people that maybe are going through something similar and feel seen or heard yeah um and it's incredibly inspiring yeah the amount of messages we get every single day from people who either go Yesterday I was on, on my bike answering DMs and there was this one kid who had literally the same uh, form of cancer and his mother would reach out to me and say like, oh, he's watching your stories every day and um, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send him a little video and that is also what enables me now to talk about it because I didn't do it for two years. I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable, I didn't feel the urge, I didn't, I didn't understand why would I do it. And now something has shifted and clicked and back to the recording part. Honestly, I didn't want to record anything. It was my... What was that block? Like, what, what do you think was stopping you from wanting to share? Was it vulnerability? That for sure. Also, there was this, especially when I recovered, 
I remember having this therapy session and I told my therapist, I feel like because of this, I'm, I lost credibility. I am like, I talk about health. I talk about those kind of things and you know, I got cancer. So that's a bit, that, that was like, if I would just share my honest thought at the time, I was like, I'm less of a good coach because that happened. But hang on. So you were it's rationalizing that you were, you, you were telling your, yourself that story yeah. must be based on the premise of I got cancer and it was my fault. Like, were you blaming yourself? Because my understanding is that th the type of cancer that you had, the kind of causes are not even known. Yeah. So it'd be difficult to blame yourself for getting that cancer. It would be difficult to say, hey, I developed this cancer because I was living in an unhealthy manner. I th hmm, I'm not sure. Maybe I did. I remember also asking myself early stages, I would ask myself, why me? Why me? And I would ask the doctors and it drove me bananas. Ask a lousy question, you get lousy results. It drove me crazy to ask myself, why me? Why me? Why did that happen to me? And I, and I asked them, you know, I asked the doctors, why did this happen? I ate healthy. I exercised. I did all of the things. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink all of it. Why on earth me? And they just said, well, sometimes injustice happens. Sometimes shit happens. What do you think we're going to We We have kids here who are two years old who just got leukemia. What do you think we're going to tell them? You didn't do your burpees? Sometimes stuff happens and it's up to you to decide why it's happened. And I'm like, oh, okay. And back to the moment with my therapist, I... Yeah, maybe partially I blamed me. Like there could have been things that I could have done better for sure. Mm. But it was probably just the fear of not not being enough and um, felt like also showing myself like this is, yeah, for sure. It's not not always easy. It's also not, I know it's not easy to watch for my for my loved ones. My my ex partner she sent me a message yesterday. Um, just you know, bef before this episode, I pr prepared and I went through all of the pictures and videos, and I, I I reached out and said like, just you going through this with me was one of the most beautiful things I've ever witnessed in my entire life. So I just wanna I wanna I wanna say thank you. Tomorrow I'm gonna be uh, part of one of my favorite podcasts that I listen to, and um, without you I wouldn't be here and. She then told me, you know, like, good that you reach out because I saw your video and things come up. You know, it's hard for them to watch. I know that. Uh, she played a really big role. Yeah. In your I think without recovery. her, I wouldn't be alive. One million percent. Mm. Yeah, there's kind of, it's kind of like the sub story when I was thinking about everything you've been through. There's this beautiful sub story with your relationship with her. And yeah. there's a bit for us to kind of hopefully unpack there. But what when, so you're speaking with your therapist. Yeah. And you kind of have this sort of block or you don't feel called to share. Um, when does that change? How do you reframe things to say, you know what, I'm not going to blame myself here. Instead, I'm going to offer the world a great gift because this experience that I've been through, I can inspire and I can teach other people that are perhaps going through similar challenges. Yes. So what my therapist does is he calls it reality check. He asked me, okay, you have that thought, you have that belief. Let's do a reality check here. Let's see what reality really is like. Do you think because of what you went through, you learn anything new? I was like, yeah, for sure. I learned a lot of things. And he's like, yeah, tell me. I'm like, okay, well, first of all, my perspective on life changed because, you know, I was 26 and all of the, I know what it's like to face death. I know what really matters in life. That's a unique perspective that usually only pe old people get to witness. And um, I would, I'd ha I had to deal with fear, something that affects everybody here. Everybody has fear. Fear of not being enough, fear of not doing enough. We all have it. And, you know, it's one thing to recover from cancer. It's a whole different game to then live without that fear dictating your inner state. Uh, yeah, that must be a huge burden for that cancer is, survivors. Yeah, 
it is. Every day I get this question, how on earth do you do that? And because I went through this and because I asked for help and because I faced my, I like to, I don't like to call it cancer. I usually like to call it teacher. It gives me a bit, I don't know, when I hear the word cancer, it, it's, there's this negative connotation also. Like my mom died right after I was born because of cancer. And so I have a billion things that this teacher taught me and made me better as a person, as a coach, as like so many skills that I had to develop, so many lessons that it taught me. And so at the end, he didn't have to say much. He just asked questions. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, if anything, I'm better because of this. And now a couple of years later, I'm like, okay, I also see the power of sharing that story. And it's not about me anymore. I don't do anything. I don't do social media because of me. It's, be it's always been about other people. It's always been, when I started, it's been about animals and animal rights, and it still is. So I'm like, okay, if it inspires people, well, might as well share it. That fear that you would have experienced, you know, I can't even imagine what that might have felt like to, to, you know, I can kind of, I can't imagine. I just, it's not real in my mind to think about having five days to live. How, how do you turn that fear into hope or how do you manage to have some, some hope when you're given a prognosis, a diagnosis like that? You know, there are fight, flight, or freeze responses. In when I heard it for the first time, I was like, fight. I didn't I didn't focus on the fear. There was no time to to be afraid or something. I remember how there were like five doctors around the bed. I I, I was on morphine and I remember this. So this this was a big moment. I would look at them, they would say it. And I'm like, I'm not exactly I, I it's, why are you why are you acting so seriously? That's what 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 I responded. Like, what's the problem here? I I don't know if it was delusion or denial or denial. But looking back, it was good. It was like, yeah, whatever. There, there's no chance that this is happening. And um, I honestly don't know where this response came from. But it was it was gut. It was hard. I'm like, no. There's no chance that this is happening. And that's also how my, um, how my loved ones reacted. They're like, no, there must be a solution. I was riding here this morning from Uluwatu. I've been in Uluwatu the, oh, last, wow. the last couple of months. Oh, nights. wow. <laughs> uh, you're, you're on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my bike ride this morning was a little bit longer. And do you know Fred again? No. So he's, a, he's an artist and he's touring in Australia at the moment. And just randomly, I got a coffee this morning and a friend of mine was trying to buy tickets to go and see Fred again and it prompted me to listen to his, So I was listening to his music on the way here and rather serendipitously, I was listening to this song and the lyric was, if I can live through this, what comes next will be marvelous. Wow. What comes next will be marvelous. Wow. I love that. Right, and that song is, I think it's called Maria by Fred again. You got to play this epic dance tune. I love that. Right. That could be the theme song for this episode, perhaps. One million percent. Uh, because when I was hearing that lyric, I was, I was just imagining that letter that you wrote to yourself. Mm. I read that and mm. I, I, I couldn't help. My, my eyes were watering. If, honestly, it was touching, it was raw, and uh, I can see how if someone else is currently going through what you went through, that that letter would offer tremendous hope. Yeah. And really is about the fact, you know, you. I might get you to read the letter out. I wrote it down. Do you think you can read my handwriting? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I wrote the letter, so I should remember. All right, I'll try. 
Also, my handwriting sucks as well, so <laughs> I shouldn't make comments. Dear Axel, we might need tissues after this. I know you're going through hell right now. Please keep going. Don't stop. It's challenging to connect the dots at the moment, but this is happening for you, not to you. One day you will look back and this time will lead to something amazing. In just two years from now, life will be so much better. But I understand that right now, it feels like, life feels like a horror movie. Trust that spring is coming. Spring follows winter. It always did and it always will. Use this as a teacher. It's not your fault. Stop asking yourself, why me? You didn't deserve it. It's a lesson. Challenge yourself to find what's good about your life right now. And I think I said... There was more, but that was kind of the first three paragraphs or so. That's what I needed to hear the most, especially this why me question. It wasn't helpful. There was a part in my life that I think the point where my life got so much better, where when I st stood up for myself and I moved out of victimhood, I think I was 15, 16, I would ask myself this question, why me? Why did my mother die right, right after I was, I was born because of cancer? I would ask myself, like, what did I do? And then I grew up, you know, the people around me, my caregivers, they did their very best, but they, they were all alcohol addicts. I was mentally abused, physically abused. And at some point in my, I remember asking myself, like, why on earth me? Ask a lousy question, you get lousy answers. And so back then, and also 10 years later, shifting from why is this, why is this happening? to me, to why is this happening for me, changed everything. I started blaming life not just for the bad things, but also for the good things. And that perspective shift was prior to this. I did that be before. So back then, like I had to f find a new story for my, for my childhood. It was a nightmare. And at some point I realized, okay, because of all the hardship, because of the challenges, because of the abuse, I am the man that I'm proud to be. Like I wouldn't be that man. I wouldn't have the skills. I wouldn't be so thoughtful. I wouldn't be sensitive. I wouldn't be able to read emotions that quickly. I wouldn't be so close to my siblings. And especially that part was like, okay. There's beauty in that as well. Did you arrive in that place by yourself or was that also with the help of therapy or a mentor or books? Early in my life, I couldn't afford therapy and mentoring. So I just read and read and read and read every single book about psychology mindset that I could find. And yeah. I found my own mentors at the time. Now it's, you know, therapy, retreats, seminars, events, still books big reader. Mm. But honestly, when it happened, I forgot about all of this. It was like, didn't have time to think about it. But then once I got a bit better, I'm like, oh, okay, I have this toolbox. And my brother and Mari, my sister, my loved ones basically reminded me of this toolbox. So uh, there's this moment and I would love to send you that clip. So I Maybe I give context. So I had something called Burkitt leukemia. It's a very rare form of cancer. You probably have never heard about it before. Hopefully you will never, after this episode, you will never hear about it again. Um, it is rare, but really aggressive. I went from, I showed you the pictures the other day. I went from being able to squat 150 kilograms and I was fairly fit to, I'm not, I can't even walk anymore. It's pretty modest. You showed me that the uh, <laughs> the video of you working out. What was that? That was like a week before you were diagnosed. 
I think two weeks. And you were you were fit and you were jacked. Yeah, I, I was deadlifting 200 kilograms. Um, I was really fit. I would do CrossFit and I was just really fit. Um, and a couple of weeks later, I was fighting for my life. A couple of weeks later, I couldn't walk anymore. A month later, I started chemotherapy. That was absolutely bananas. And it started with some pain in your back? Yeah, I had this... First, I thought it's a trapped nerve because, you know, that stuff happens, especially when you do... 150 kilogram <laughs> Yeah, yeah that, can, <laughs> <laughs> that can happen. Um, and so I'm like, yeah, okay, well, I'm going to take it easy. And it got worse and worse and quickly worse. And all of a sudden, I couldn't sleep anymore. You're in Prague at yeah. this time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I... And when I couldn't sleep anymore, I'm like, okay, uh, maybe I should go see a doctor to a, to a hospital. Um, so I went and they're like, oh, you have back pain. Okay, well, here's some painkillers. You'll be fine. I'm like, okay. Took the painkillers. But whenever I didn't take pain, it wasn't even a painkiller, like it was a injection. Some type of steroid injection or something. Like yeah. Uh, oh, I'm like, oh, amazing. I went to bed, slept 10 hours. I'm like, great. But now I feel pain again, and it's 10 times worse. Um, so I tried again. I saw like so many different experts, and nobody, nobody really understood what it was and didn't take it seriously. I'm like, yeah, you probably have back pain. You know, like you trapped a nerve or something. You will get over it. And I'm like, okay. And at some point, it just got so bad, I could not stand anymore because the pain was so strong. I was sweating and like, it's horrible. And so, um, yeah, that's when, when I said, like, I need to go to a hospital. I need, I need help right now. And I need painkillers, a lot of them, because I can't handle any more. Um, and that's, that, that's when things started to get a bit more serious. Right. Took a turn for the worse. So you, my understanding is that you go to hospital, but it takes some time for doctors and even a change of environment yeah. to work out what is actually going on here. Yeah. They knew quickly that it was probably a cancer. Well, they did a CT scan and my, fo my whole body was full of tumors. This is still in, in the Czech Yeah, yeah, yeah that was in, in, in Prague. But I didn't know. I, I, I was just, <laughs> I was in so much pain, I didn't care. My Murray would tell me. So Murray's my ex partner. Um, I'm just going to say Murray from now on. Uh, and just and and just so that we can kind of track that story to set some context here. Were you guys together when you were diagnosed, or you? Yeah, we were together. We were. I don't think I've ever shared that before. Um, but our relationship at that point wasn't the greatest. She just moved out of um, our apartment that we shared together. And um, yeah, it was a challenging time. Um, but as soon as I, as soon as she heard that I'm not feeling well, she was like, "Screw all of this! I'm there for you." Um, so she went in there with with me, and um, she she protected me from most of the news. She wouldn't tell me, or she would. I just got the chills. She she would be very conscious about what words she used so that I don't get scared. She would say lymphoma. I was like, what the f what, what is that? Like, okay. She's like, oh, probably something with your kidneys. You'll be fine. And I needed that. So that in my mind, I'm like, okay, it's something. I'll get rid of it. And um, yeah, it got just worse and worse and worse so quickly. Like in a couple of days, I, they had to give me morphine. That's how much pain I had. Like morphine is no joke. That's something you usually only give to patients who are like in a lot of pain. You don't feel anything then. Or palliative care. Yeah. So I'm on morphine and um, I hear the news and um, I, didn't, I didn't really understand it. I also didn't care. It was this fight, flight, or freeze response. I'm like, I'm, I'm fighting. I don't have time to think about this. Just tell me what is the solution. And when I heard that the solution is, obviously skipping something, and I know you will ask questions, the solution is chemotherapy. And the odds, I, I wanted to hear numbers. 
I think they threw numbers into the room like 70, 80 percent of you survive. I'm like 70, 80 percent. Let's freaking do this. <laughs> that sounds good. I also know that I, you know, I treated my liver and my organs with a lot of respect so they can handle this. And you're fit and healthy. I'm and, fit and, and healthy and I will cover. This with a lot of muscle. Yeah. I'll get through this. Because that's one of the biggest concerns, right? With chemotherapy is, is muscle wastage and weight loss. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I have to be honest, I wasn't scared about that. I, I knew I will recover. Like the muscle pile, I did not care. Even I'm, if I'm all not of talking about from an aesthetic point of view. Mm -hmm. I just think from, an, from a uh, survival rate point of view, it's advantageous Got it. to have more muscle tissue going into it. Yeah, I had enough muscle tissue going into it, for sure. Um, yeah. Hey friends, are you ready to take your fermented food game and gut health to the next level? Look no further than my digital guide, Plant-Based Ferments. Inside, you'll discover some of my favorite recipes, including my soy labneh and homemade kombucha. Visit theproof.com forward slash ferments for more details. That's theproof.com forward slash ferments. Okay. That's enough from me. Let's get back to the episode. So you, you're in Prague. Yeah. At what point and why do you move over to the German healthcare system? Well, I, I was on morphine. Like I didn't make many decisions. It was, they told my, my, um, they told Mari, call your family, call his family. He maybe has five days, maybe. Like his kidneys are about to fail, he's gonna die. And we can't put him on chemotherapies, a therapy because of his kidneys. Get his family in here as quickly as you can. And she did that. And were you aware of, of what they had said about five days? They probably told me, but I had so much morphine in my system. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'll get through this. And again, my like they did such a good job, my loved ones, they did such a good job of protecting me from any kind of negative news. So they protected you then, but you can still now reflect on it. Yeah, now that, I can reflect. That I was in it. <laughs> it's funny because I don't know if this is, if you can relate to this, but sometimes I think back to my past and I think about experiences. And I'm like, was that even me? It's hard to relate to, but mm -hmm. I'm sure you can go back to that, that period and think about the fact that Mari was told you had five days to live. Thinking about that, how has that changed your perspective on life? That is usually that part um, that's the hardest for me. She told me later most of the stories, like once everything was over. She told me when I got the CT scan, she was standing right next to the doc, uh, like the person who was supervising the CT scan. And there were like tumors all over around my body. And she told me what it was for her to see that. How she was just, like, you see the person you love the most. In front of you, you see like all the tumors on the, and you're like, he's going to die. Like imagine what it's like uh, when they tell you your boyfriend, the person you love is going to die. Call his family. I don't know how much strength and courage you have to just say no. He's not. And instead of coming to me and like crying and... um being scared she would she would come in she would bring me food she would she would sit next to me hold my hand and play like healing music that's her kind of kind of thing you know and would tell yeah it's probably one of the most loving things someone has ever done for me but it how did it change my perspective it made me the whole experience made me realize love and connection is the number one thing because in that moment I didn't, I told you, I didn't care about how I look. I didn't care about my business. I didn't care about Instagram. Right. 
all these like all abstract of these, all of those things that were occupying my mind before engagement i was like screw all of this i would have given everything away take it in fact i would have even said if i need to if i need to owe, if i need to repay 10 million bucks i'll do it everything to just be able to have dinner with Murray. So when you take away all of those things that occupy our mind, what is left? I think it's love and connection. That's what matters most. All I care about is hugging the person I love most, spending time with my siblings. Like everything else became so irrelevant. That's one of the most beautiful gifts that this teacher taught me. Because now when I go back to the real world, I don't stress so much about numbers anymore. What do you do to, to kind of keep that fresh in the mind, not, not lose sight of that? You know, it's, it's easy to, I can imagine, to slip back into to yeah. old, old yeah. patterns where, yeah. where uh, now it's, you know, you're not facing death, but uh, it would be easy to kind of start to take some of these really meaningful, important things for granted again. Potentially. I'm putting words in your mouth there. One million percent. Well, conversations like this helps me because I remember, oh my God, this is what you went through. Like, this is what matters most. Every single time when I see Mari or I see my brother, I see my sister, I see my friends who went with me through this, I'm like, don't forget that. So those are kind of the anchors in my life. That remind me that time is limited. You don't know how much time you have left. Nobody knows. It's an illusion. Like sometimes we act as if we have another 200, 300, 400 years. Or we think we're invincible. Right? You, th you just expect you're going you're gonna to make it until you're 90, 100. I don't know what life, exp what most people expect, you know, but probably like 80, 90. Truth is, you don't know. I think, I think most people understand that, but don't really want to spend time thinking about it because on face value, it seems like a very morbid thing to contemplate your death or to realize that we're not invincible. Yes. But what I'm hearing from you is that actually being in touch with the fact that life is not guaranteed doesn't have to be morbid. It can be a form of gratitude. Yes. It it's, doesn't have to be a scary thing. It does not have to be a scary thing. There is beauty to it. Because it means time is precious. How does someone get there that isn't in your situation? <laughs> they, haven't had, they haven't had a significant health scare. I mean, there are a million ways and I don't, I don't ever want to scare people with my story. I want to do the opposite. I want to inspire them. I want to give them, I want to show them how beautiful life is. I... I don't think you have to necessarily think about death. I think the opposite of gratitude is taking something for granted and or complaining. And so if you just have a practice, like, more, you know, you go to the gym. If you have a practice every day where you can just for a couple minutes focus on all the things that are good about your life, all the people who love you, all the people that you love. If you do that, you make sure that you focus on the most important thing. And it's very simple. If you focus most of the time on what's missing, you experience lack. And that's why you have people who have everything in terms of like money and fame. But they focus constantly on what's missing and that's then what you experience. So my answer would be have somewhat of a routine every single day where you focus on all the things that are good about your life. All the people that love you because you don't want to end up at some point regretting not being able to tell them that you love them. And then I would, I would re recommend to everybody, you know, reading books like The Medi uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Such a good book. Or there is the speech by Steve Jobs in front of the Stanford uh, University. Have you listened to it? He talks Perhaps. about one of the best speeches I've ever heard in my life. And he talks about how he calls death the best invention of life because you realize that you are already naked. 
you are not so scared anymore. I'm not scared anymore of failing or like, I don't care whether you, whether John who trains with me in the gym likes me or not, because I know it doesn't matter. I care about the people that I love. I care about the people who love me. That's all that matters. And if you, if you are able right now to zoom out, out of your matrix or whatever you want to call it, and just see what really matters is, I don't know if most people ask themselves, what is actually, if shit would hit the fan, what would really matter to me? Oh, probably my kids, probably my partner. My health. My health, one million percent. If you speak to someone who has lost their health, they would tell you like, this is the most important thing, together with love and connection, health. What would you trade? I would trade everything, everything, every single penny. I, I, not just every single penny, I would take that unlimited to just be able to walk again. For 26 years, I took those beautiful two legs for granted. And all of a sudden I can't walk anymore. That reminds me of a, a TED talk. Have you heard of the, the, the girl who fell out of the sky? No. No, I'm curious. There's this TED talk. I, I, I think her name's Emma, Emma Carey. Hopefully I got that right. It's called The Girl Who Fell From The Sky. She wrote a book about this too. And she had a similar experience. It's just one thing that's stuck in my mind where she went skydiving. So she was in her early 20s and I believe she was doing like the Europe trip kind of thing, Australian girl, and went skydiving, tandem skydiving. And something happened with the parachute and it ended up going around the uh, instructor's neck and he he was unconscious as they were coming down and the parachute didn't open properly and so they had a, a crash landing but she survived and in an instance she went from you know being on the ground getting excited ready to skydive to being paralyzed unable to Move her legs. You just spoke then about taking your legs for granted. And I just remember her, th she, oh, man, she, she, she said, so she tried to roll over and get, because she was, she was on the ground and he was on the top of her. And she was trying to like roll over to check that he was okay. And also just like to be able to stand up mm -hmm. and realized even though she was sending the same messages that she would always send to move her legs, she couldn't move them. Yeah. And she said, I just wanted to like click undo, <laughs> you know, like on the computer. Yeah, yeah. click undo. Let's click, click undo. I yes. just want to go back five minutes, five minutes. Um, and, you know, so I hear these, I hear what you're saying and I hear that. And I can intellectualize this, but it's so much harder to grasp when you haven't been through something like that. So much easier to slip into these habits of taking things for granted. I get it. I think we human beings have the ability to learn in two ways, either trial and error, like kid burns his or her hand on a hot stove or oven, or you learn from the mistakes of others. And if you, there's this another great book, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying, where Bronnie Ware interviews people on their deathbed. Listen to those stories. They tell you all the same thing. Nobody tells you like, I wish I would have worked harder. I wish I would have spent more time in the office. I wish I would have gotten this promotion. No, they'll tell you, I wish I would have spent more time with the people I love. I wish I would have not been so scared of doing the things that I want to do. I wish I would have lived more. I wish I would have not cared so much about what other people think of me and be really unapologetically myself. We were talking about this before. How many people in your life can you truly be yourself around? Yeah. In my case, maybe a couple. We all, you know, we're wearing masks. I mean, it's a good sign. I, I told you before. We should have recorded this. Uh, I told you before, like there are a couple, 
I know someone is re I'm really close and I'm really connected to someone when I can't, can when I can start singing around that person and be really goofy like a like a little kid sometimes like the people who get to see that side I know those are the people who they have access to my heart like I can really let go of all of the walls and masks and be really myself that, uh, that's also like a beautiful check-in with yourself like who are the people who loves you who is the first person you think of when i ask you who loves you who do you love and that's you know you don't have to go through the same experience that i went through but i tell you that person that sh that person should be number one priority in your life together with your health because without health you're screwed like you can't do the things you can't show up for your loved ones you can't do you think it's possible for other people to love you fully if you don't love yourself first? I don't know. I maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. But there's an interesting thing about love. Whenever you give love, you feel loved. And so I would start maybe, you know, listening to the podcast right now, shoot a message to someone you really love, just, not because it's their birthday, but just because you're going to be happy one day that you did. Put your ego aside and start loving. Not just start living. That reminds me recently, my partner, Tawny, we were sitting around and we were talking about my brother. And she was like, do you love your brother? And I was like, of course. And she said, well, when's the last time you've told him? And, you know, I had to be honest. It, it, I hadn't told him that I loved him for probably a decade or more. You know, it was assumed, like, I think he could feel the love and I could feel his love. Uh, but it was, it was never kind of verbalized. And so she encouraged me to do exactly as you just said. Send him a message. Mm -hmm. And immediately I was, like, scared. And, and I had to analyze it. I'm like, why am I scared here? I'm, well, maybe I'm scared that he won't reciprocate. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe he won't write back. And anyway, so I said, okay, I'll do it in the next week. She said, do it now. <laughs> <laughs> I've never met your partner, but I already like her. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I did it. Uh -huh. And I waited and I waited. And uh, he wrote back and, and said, I love you too, bro. Mm. And so beautiful yeah it was a it was a beautiful kind of moment and a, and a reminder as you said to kind of sometimes we think think things like this are scarier than they actually are yeah and it's quite liberating one million percent i'm also so grateful that you bring this up because my brother he doesn't get enough credits for you know this journey my recovery so much happened because of him he I, I don't I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but I remember this moment also suits like ties in nice with the storyline at the moment. So we are in uh, in Germany, Charité, amazing hospital. Um, I started round one of chemotherapy. They did a bone marrow puncture. They knew exactly what it was. This is how you do it. Yes, your kidneys will probably fail. Uh, so we have to put you on dia dialysis, dialysis. Is that how you pronounce it? Um, beautiful machine. Saved my life, but it's hell of a process. Like everybody who has been on that machine, it's one of the most challenging things I've ever done. Like, are you doing that by yourself like or are you in a room with other people? I'm, no, no, no. I couldn't be with anybody who is not like, so, so my, everybody who was seeing me had to, Obviously, disinfect everything, had to wear this protective, I don't know if there's a word for it, but you needed this, I'll call it, like protective clothes. You know what I mean. Like everything had to be sterile because my immune, my immunity was so low that in anything could have killed me. Like any slight infection. I was not, not allowed to eat raw vegetables or anything, nuts. And this was also kind of on the tail end of COVID. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. It, 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 also, it was COVID. So, like, if he gets COVID, he's cr like, it could literally just kill him. At that time, um, 
in, you call it intensive care unit? Mm-hmm. That's what ICU, intensive ICU, care unit. Intensive care unit. Um, just by myself in a room, seven million wires. At some point I wake up. Imagine you wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, where am I? I have no clue. I look to the right, so there's this big massive machine. I lift the blanket, I'm like, where are all those wires coming from and what are they doing here? Like literally 25 wires connected to my body. And I told you, like, I was on morphine, so most of the things I just understood later, my brother told me, my sister told me, Mari told me what happened. At the moment, I'm like, what is going on here? And I had those weird hallucinations. Um, and there, there was this period, probably like two weeks long, where they didn't know if I would make it or not. And I was, most of the time, I wasn't conscious. God, that's got to be hard on your family and Mari. Yeah, that was terrible for them. I don't remember anything from that time period. I just remember the hallucina- hallucinations because they were awful. And they're also funny, but also awful. Um, and I remember laying there and I had 10 out of 10 pain. Even with morphine. It was horrible. Like I would, I could... My whole body was full of water because of like I started chemotherapy, and because it's, it's such a aggressive form of cancer, it the the cells are dividing so f- quickly. It also is really sensitive to chemotherapy, which is good, but can also kill you because you know, there's this thing. There's probably a fancy term for it: too many ca- dead cancer cells in your body, and you sc- like you die. So when you say ten out of ten pain, describe that for me is that a concentrated pain like it's in one particular area or just <sighs> shooting systemic? pain from especially in my back i don't know if it was you know all the water in my my system i went to 105 kilograms and with the weight i lost because of the water i think i showed you a picture of my legs it was my whole body was just full of wa- water from you know that cancer cells and just everything was sh- like sh- shooting pain everywhere, especially my back um, from laying. I could not comfortably lay. I was laying for weeks without standing up. That's painful already. So every couple hours, someone would come in and move me. Like I had, didn't have the strength to move myself. So every two, every hour, every two hours, someone would come and like, I don't know how they did it, but they like yeah. there was some crazy New sheets. Thing. I've done that when I was a physio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so to I, stop you getting bed sores and exactly. Uh, like I remember this. It's just painful to lay to exist. That was probably the m- most painful period, and the on- there was only one person allowed to come in, and they said like, "Who's going to do the job?" Mari could have not done it. I'm a heavy guy, also, and it would have been. I would have just cried the whole time seeing her and I would have not said like, do you do anything? So it was my brother. And um, if I think about someone who loves me the most, my brother comes up and he would, there's this, I'm so happy at, I have this on, on re- record. There was this flip chart in front of my bed. And he said, we're going to write down a couple of goals, things you want to do, things you want to achieve. And my brother is my biggest fan. He follows my work, everything I teach, listens to my podcasts. And so he remember, I always preach about the importance of knowing what you want. Is he older or younger? He's uh, young, uh, sorry, older, seven years, seven years older. And he's like, we're going to write down goals. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm going through chemotherapy. Like, what are you talking about? He's like, if you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for Mari. I'm like, you son of a gun. That's a good way to get you to buy in. Yeah, I was like... So we wrote down things like three push-ups. Back then I couldn't walk. Like I could not even stand up. Three push-ups. Standing for five minutes. Uh, Sorry, five seconds. That was my first goal. Five seconds. And every day doubling that. Walking 50 meters. Like that was... Next time the nurse comes and sees the goals, I'm like... I saw her laughing at it. Or like saying, you're going to do, pu- like, how are you doing push-ups? You can't even stand. I'm like, oh, no. This no. is during round one of chemotherapy. Yeah, round one was the craziest one because it was um, just too many ca- dead cancer cells died. I was also in this 
dialysis machine, which was taking out my life energy. It also saved my life. I'm insanely grateful for the technology, um, but it's not a nice process. I barely slept, um, but I had my brother with me every single freaking day he would come in. I don't know how he did it, because I was also not in my best mood. Sleep deprived, malnourished. That's understandable. But he would, he would just be positive. He'd sit there, make funny jokes, be nice to the nurses. He's the kindest sweetheart. He would, you know, massage me the whole day. And um, yeah, that teacher taught me, like, we got so close during that time. And I could not be more grateful for someone in my, in my life because, you know, I tell him all the time. Sometimes he gets a bit uncomfortable when I tell him I love you, but I t every single time I say, I, love, I, like, I, I freaking love you. And knowing that bond between yourself and a sibling, you know, we don't see each other every day, but I know I love him and he knows and he loves me. And I know when shit hits the fan. Mm, yeah, he showed up for you big time. And I would do the same thing. And then that, that's something maybe, you know, for someone who doesn't, who has never been through something like this. When you just, there is the possibility at some point, everybody will go through this. At some point, you're going to love, you're going to lose someone that you love. It's inevitable. At some point, someone will die. You're going to feel amazing. Or you're gonna feel so much better if they hurt their whole life that you love them and th that you don't have regret. Imagine being 80, 90 and you've never told your kids that you love them or your brother. That's gonna be painful. Past this wisdom, so how about you do it right Why now? Why do you think we hold back? We're scared. Ego. Why did you hold back? Yeah, I was, I guess I was scared that he wouldn't reciprocate. What if I'm not loved? What if not? Yeah. Does that matter? It sounds like your brother, I mean, earlier you, I think you spoke of this as a teacher and helping you reframe a, a problem or challenge, as, yeah. as you like to say, yeah. uh, from something that's happening to you to something that's happening for you and then having some responsibility to be able to move forward rather than playing a kind of blame game victim mindset it sounds like him coming in and setting up goals and giving you a target and things to work on may have been part of that shift one million percent and then also seeing the progress was just a lot of fun we went from five seconds, just stand for five seconds, to, okay, next day we do 10. Or, okay, next day we do 20. Okay, hot today, first three steps. Before we start around, uh, round two of chemotherapy, there's also a clip of that. I'm walking 50 meters once a day. I mean, it sounds ridiculous when you hear that walking, for you. it's not a big deal. But you see that clip, there's an oxygen mask on my face there's an ox oxygen bottle i could the whole time i had oxygen supply because my lungs were full of water every other day there would be a doctor who would do a lung puncture and get water out of my lungs so that i could breathe so just getting out of my bed was that was the biggest accomplishment of my day then like after that i had to rest for three hours also keep in mind i didn't walk for a couple of months like a month i was just laying in a bed just standing up like oh i don't want to stand up okay do it for murray do it for love like he had literally do, he was my personal trainer at the time like i said no i don't want to he's like you're gonna do it just do it three two one i use this i preach about this three second rule and he's like three two one just do it just the first step What's the three-second rule? The three-second rule. Mel Robbins, do you know her? Mm -hmm. she, she's fantastic. She yeah, wrote she's that, a great podcast. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. She has this five second rule. She wrote the book Five Seconds. Uh, I think it's literally called Five Second Rule. So you've adapted that to three seconds. Yeah, yeah. Because if I count, I can't <laughs> count to five. <laughs> no, I just find it. You know, when I'm like five, four, three, and uh, maybe not do it. Three, two, one, just do it. So the the whole idea is you have an intuition, you have an idea, you have something that you want to do. Count three, two, one, and just take the first step. Do the the, just the first step. The first step is usually the hardest. And so he's like, three, two, one, just do it. First step, you can do it. And I did it. And every day, and then I would be so excited to tell him about the process, uh, progress na- the next day. And I would send it to Mari. Like, look, I'm, I'm walking. And she would cheer me on for that. Um, and then at, before round two started, I was walking 50 meters with this. I don't know how you call that, but you know, it like supports you. Yeah. To, it's like a type of assisted walking frame. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah, and I just put, I had a lot of time to spend in a room. So I wrote, not only wrote down my goals, one day Mari came in, she's like, we, let's create vision boards for you. You need something to look at. And I would send her pictures. She would print it out and put it on the, on the whole wall, pictures of, things that matter to me. I had a couple of Viktor Frankl quotes in front of me, a book that I've read a couple times during that process, Man's Search for Meaning. I needed, I needed a role model during that time. Like I needed someone, I needed success stories. I remember being on Instagram and looking for success stories for people who went through similar things, made it out of there and lived a nice, beautiful, long life. I couldn't find many. And so I said, if I make it out of here, I'm going to be one of those success stories and I'm, I'm going to share it. And uh, yeah, so my whole wall was full of like Viktor Frankl quotes. For some reason, I really like, one important thing for me was to get old with a, like I would, there were pictures of old couples being happy. I don't know why. I saw it yesterday when I prepped this session. Um, I was like, why did I care so much about that? that? That was the picture that was most important to me. Getting old, having a family, and being in love. It comes back to, to what is most meaningful. Probably. And it was like, it was subconsciously. I just cared about that the most. You put up a video, I think it was a, a Viktor Frankl quote, between uh, stimulus and response. There is a space. And in that space lies your growth and your freedom. Unpack what that means to you. So between stimulus and response, if you hear news, if something happens, anything, there is time and spa- space to respond to whatever happens. And if you have the ability to, to pause and just see I'm the person who gives things meaning. It's me. I can say this is the end of the life of my life and I'm going to stay in victim mode or this is the beginning of a new life. It's up to me. One thing happens, you get plenty of different interpretations of the same event. So that's your power, that's your freedom. F- full self-responsibility. I love that word self-responsibility. Your ability... Just listen, responsibility, response, your responsibility. So it's not the event that makes it stressful. It's you. It's your interpretation of the event that makes it stressful. And that's so powerful because then you are creating your life. You have to be able to pause and, yeah. and, and, and get awareness of whatever you're experiencing in order to, to then change your response one million percent it's also a scary place but it can also be a beautiful place because then you can you can change your reality because life is not about what what happens to you it's about how you deal with it that dictates the quality of your life there's one thing one thing happens one person responds with anger and the other person responds with laughter 
You know, in Germany, where I'm from, if someone honks, you get angry. In Bali, someone honks and like, ah, I'm just telling you, and then I'm here, all is good, life is beautiful. Right. It's the same thing, two different responses. And there are so many examples that I could give, but it starts with your responsibility saying like, hey, I'm in control here. I'm giving things meaning. And that's what Victor, Victor Frankl's work is about. You imagine you are, so in that moment, it helped me so much because I knew that guy is in a concentration camp. He lost his family. His family was killed in front of him. And somehow he manages to even help and inspire others. He comes out of this and no one would have blamed him or shamed him for choosing victimhood. It was awful. But he's like, no, I'm going to dedicate my life to helping others. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to find love again. And that to me was like, yes, this is the kind of story that I need in my life right now. Because otherwise, like, otherwise I get crazy. I need a compelling vision. I need a compelling future. That's also what something he talks in this book about. The people who, who died the quickest were the people who didn't have a compelling vision. Something that happens afterwards. He, he said about himself, he was so excited about finishing that book that he was writing before that. That motivated him. For me, it was, hey, I can't, like, I'm so excited to one day walk out of here and just be able to travel with Mari again. So excited to sit in a go-kart with my brother and race each other. I'm so excited to go to the gym again, to go back to Bali at some point. I, have to, I needed this vision board. I needed to see all of the things that I can still do. That gives you hope. Yeah. And you need hope. You need faith. You need something exciting in the future. It's so easy to fall into victim, playing the victim, you know. Um, I, I was in LA, this is like a year ago or so, and I'd fallen into this trap of mm -hmm. playing victim. I had uh, come out of a six-year relationship and that didn't end as I would have liked mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, lost my relationship, my dogs, where I lived in my community, my restaurant, mm -hmm. and I was for a while in a very, I had this, I'd adopted a victim mindset and I was blaming a lot of external mm -hmm. factors. And... The reason I share this is because I think what you just described, it starts with some form of awareness yes. in order to, to, to have this kind of responsibility, self-responsibility. You have to have awareness. Yeah. And I lacked that awareness. And I had a conversation with Rich Roll. This is off air. And it, it, it actually just took someone who cared enough about me to say to me, I think you need to re-examine all of the events where you're at now and not blame yourself, but hold yourself accountable. How did, did you contribute to the relationship dissolving? How did you contribute to where you are now rather than focusing on who else might be at blame or at fault? And that it's a hard process. Oh, yeah, it is. Right? Because you have to get nuts. you have to get real with the person who matters the most in your life, which is yourself. Yeah. And what I realized through that, my biggest learning from that was that until you can get really real with yourself and be accountable and have this kind of self responsibility. You you can't fully love yourself. Yes, I completely agree. And in my case, many of my thoughts and also my actions were not aligned with what my values and 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 beliefs were. But I can categorically say, as soon as I started taking accountability 
and instead of playing the victim and and not not blaming myself but seeing you know what are the lessons my happiness started to grow life became so much better yeah it frees you because if you blaming is very easy it's a Everybody part of can least resistance right exactly it's yeah 1 million percent taking responsibility takes guts and courage it also means that you probably made some mistakes that you did some things wrong i probably we're skipping a bit of of the story here but i referred a couple of times to Mari and that we're not together anymore and whenever i share that on social media um like for my community it was heartbreaking when i when i when we talked about it and we talked about it seven eight months after it happened so we had time to digest it um i remember going into that same like i knew all of this and i still went to victim mode and like for for two weeks i was like just like how on earth are you doing this right now and then the wife of my therapist said it beautiful thing he said no breakup ever happens out of the blue you can spend your time focusing all of on all of the negative things that your ex-partner that your that happened in your past you're giving all your power away in that moment and it's also not fair it would be only fair if you blame the person not just for the bad things but also for the good things. One of the most healing things I've ever done. I've ever done. I don't know if I ever shared this. I don't think so. I do this because I feel comfortable with you. So, Mari, we were in LA at the same time. Uh, I think you were in LA too. Then Maybe. doesn't matter. We, it's we, in we, LA. We, don't go oh. to LA. <laughs> Your father's gonna break up with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for me, it ca- it felt like out of the blue. She ended things. Um, and it was devastating for me, for me because I thought that's the one. Like I'm gonna marry her in my head. I married her already. That's hard. Uh, already, we already had a name for like our kids and stuff. I just th- I thought this is it. Like I, like the thing we went through together that created the strong bond, and it it's not gonna end. I took it for granted. I have to admit. Like I sometimes I regret that. Um, and I would go into victim mode for a couple of weeks. It's like, why did you do that? And why didn't you do it like this? And it would have been nice to know before and blah, 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 blah. Blaming her. Blaming her. Like for weeks I was blaming her. Um, and I went to, I remember that day, I went to a Tony Robbins event and he said exactly that thing. If you blame life for the bad things, you also have to blame life for the good things. If you blame people for all of the all of the shit they did, wouldn't it be fair to also tell them about all of the beautiful things they did? And how about you write a letter or you call someone who needs to hear about the good things as well? And I'm like, you son of a gun. So the event ends. I pick up my, my phone. I haven't talked to Mari in weeks. Pick up the phone. I call her. I'm like, I have... Four percent battery left. And I'm like, Mari, I have four percent battery. Please just listen. I don't expect an answer, a respond, nothing. I just want to tell you something. And I told her about all of the good things as well. You know, thank you for being there with me through the most difficult time of my life. Thank you for the massive growth. Thank you for all the honesty, for all the laughter. I think one, the reason why I have such defined apps is also because of her, because she's one of the funniest people alive, like belly laughs. Um, love a good belly laugh. Love a good belly laugh, right? <laughs> so good for your ass. <laughs> Thank you for all the, the delicious food. Thank you for, you know, whenever I had a problem, I could just call you and I still can. And also thank you for having the courage to break up with me because I really needed it. And I was like, where did this just come from? But I felt it. It was honest. And I really believed that. It was the right thing for her and for me, for all our happiness. And that was the most freeing moment. And then I, now I can talk about her 
with a smile on my face and happiness. And I feel, I still feel that appreciation and gratitude for her. That's self-responsibility. That's not blaming. 10 million times more empowering. Hey friends, if you'd like to stay connected and reinforce the valuable insights from this show, let's connect on Instagram. You can find me at Simon Hill. That's at Simon Hill. I look forward to seeing you there. All right, let's dive back into the episode. Okay, let's come back to hospital. <laughs> we need to fully unpack this story. Yes. So, I, as I can kind of picture it, you have this vis- visualization board, you have goals, you have all these things to maintain hope to cultivate positivity but i have to imagine it can't all be roses it this must be ebbing and flowing there must be moments like to take us into the experience into the shoes of someone that's going through this what was that wrestle like between despair between anger frustration blaming and then thinking about the old couple on the visualization board or going to the gym and what did that look like? I would say, thank you for mentioning that uh, because sometimes I sugarcoat things. I think 5% of my day was good. 95% was shit. Especially the time when I didn't feel physically well. Um, And I remember just crying for hours and hours. Just being in my bed especially during the evening and just crying and like, what did just happen? And the better I got physically, the worse I got mentally. Because also, you know, all of those nice little uh, painkillers you got. And they're all of a sudden, they're like, oh, you feel better. So we reduce it. And at some point I wasn't taking anything anymore. Now you have to deal with it. No, I have to deal with it. And I remember, I remember this vividly laying in my bed, just crying for hours in the third day of in, in a row. Just, I didn't know, nothing happened. I just, I was just crying, crying. It felt like my body needed to cry and release all of the trauma that just happened. And there were awful things that happened. So many, you know, people touch me at places where you don't want to be touched. And sometimes I felt treated like a, looking back, like a, not like a human being. You know, they needed to do this. But I remember laying in the hospital, I, was so, I had so much pain. There was this doctor in front of me. I didn't understand the language. And all of the sudden, I have a finger inside of my butt. I was like, what is this? And I couldn't do anything. You know, they tried to help me, but it's like something you have to deal with at some point. I had a cathedral. That's not a nice thing to run a wa- run around with. Those are meant to be damn painful. Yeah, and it's also just I couldn't go to the toilet by myself. Did you start to lose your identity? And I'm all about freedom. I'm all about self sufficiency. You know, I'm the strong guy. That's my identity. I'm strong. I can do whatever I want. And all of a sudden, teacher. I had to rely on other people. Literally to take me to the toilet. I had to ask someone for help. And in the past, I used to have difficulties to ask for help. I was conditioned my whole childhood to not ask for help, do it by yourself. Now I had to literally press a button and like, I need to go to the toilet. Can you please help me? Very humbling experience. Now it's so helpful because now I have, can have a team and tell them like, hey, can you help me? I'm, like, I'm a bit overwhelmed or like, I can't do all of this by myself. Like, can you just help with this process? But back then my days were horrible most of the days. If you would have been a fly in my head at that time, especially when during that first round of chemotherapy, I was really scared of death. I was, I had those moments, like overall, you know, I was like, I'm going to make it. But I had moments where I'm like, am I going to die? Were there things running through your mind at that time where you thought, I wish I had done this. I wish I had done that. Oh, yeah. I wish I would have 
not worked so much. For sure. I wish I would have been nicer to Mari at certain times. Be less stressed. Take a more holiday. <laughs> For sure. Turn your freaking phone off. Don't work so much. Don't stress so much about things that don't mean. Like, yeah, I had regret. One million percent. I, had, I lived a beautiful life before that. And I saw that as well, but I had regret. You know, I could live wherever I want to live. I had my own business. I was, uh, let's say, fairly successful. Coached people that I wanted to coach. Like, it was good, but I still had regret. And you, you had done all of that coming from a very small town, right? Yeah, in Germany. I'm a village boy. Yeah. And I, like six years ago, I didn't even speak English. I remember. You're doing great. Thank you you're so doing, much. You're actually doing better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Good day, mate. Um, yeah. And, but, but thank you so much for mentioning that because that's, that's important. And not often, I don't talk often enough about those moments too because I had fear of dying. I had the fear of dying. Of course I had the fear of dying. I also had the fear of it returning later. Is that fear of, of, it returning later, something that will always be there for you? I don't think so. I got, I mean, well, maybe, maybe it's there somewhere. I just got a lot better with dealing with it. And also, obviously, time helps. What's, what's something that people who haven't gone through cancer treatment, something that people maybe don't understand about the journey, your experience... What is something they don't understand? Yeah, like what, what are, what's something about your experience that you learned uh, about going through cancer treatment that perhaps f people on the outside are just completely unaware of, of what that person's going through? I think we talked about it, but that's, that's the correct answer or like my, my experience facing death. That's what I didn't do it. For 26 years, I took my life for granted. I thought, you know, I'm living healthy, I'm eating healthy, I'm going to live until I'm 100, 120, for sure. And I don't think we... When I was 18, I read that book, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Then I thought about, like, oh my gosh, I want to make my... I want to really live. I remember that line, not everybody... Everybody dies, but not everybody lives. I'm like, I really want to make it count. I want to really live. Someone who f goes through cancer treatment will face, uh, you know, you, that's what you think about. Am I going to die? The word cancer itself has such a big impact. Immediately when you hear cancer, you like fear. It's very provocative. It's like, shit, cancer. It's almost like when someone has a heart attack or something, compared to when you hear someone has cancer, you're like, cancer, oh my gosh, heart attack, okay. You, obviously nothing nice, but I think this cancer word activates fear in people. And someone who goes through cancer treatment knows what it's like to face death, for sure. And that gives you a unique opportunity. And I wish for people who listen to this episode right now, just for a second, that they understand that time is limited. It's such a precious thing. How important are things like meditation and breath work, things that you practice on a daily to, to kind of get that, cultivate that awareness, that perspective, and keep it front of mind? Every single day I do it. Every single day I sit down and I think about the people I love. Every, I think every, every day I think about death. For some people it might be extreme or not, but I like to ask myself, hey, time is limited, which is a fact. Time is precious, it's a fact. How do I want to spend my time? What do I want to create today? What do I want to achieve today? Not to just put things on my to-do list, so it's on my to-do list, but to actually create things that I'm really proud of. Like, would I do this if, you know, today would be the last day of my life? If it's, if the answer is no, I'm, I don't want to do it anymore. Like, what for? To have one more zero on my bank account? Hmm. Would it matter? No. You know, you're not taking all of your belongings with you once you die. 
Like they're gone. They're not yours right now. You think they're yours, but as soon as you, as soon as life is over, they're like, okay, well, someone else will own it. It's not yours. But what forever is yours are the memories that you make with people, the connections, the love. That's what you will be most proud of. You telling your brother, like, I love you. And doing fun things together. That's what counts. So you go through first round of chemotherapy. That's the hardest. That's, that's, that's the round of chemotherapy that takes its greatest toll on your body. Where I think you, you went from, that's when you went from 90 kilograms yeah, down to 60. So you, you lost one third of your body weight. And was, was a lot of that simply because you, you weren't eating enough calories? You lost your appetite or? Well, I was in a huge calorie deficit, deficit that's for sure. Mm, I also, I was nauseous during the first round. I was throwing up. Um, I, yeah, I, I wasn't eating. I think it also takes a lot of energy to, you know, for your body to respond. So my body was basically just burning my muscle mass. Was there a lot of focus on on nutrition from the doctors at that point to try and <laughs> attenuate some of this? Uh, I remember loss. this day so vividly. <laughs> they came in and they said, "Well, this guy." They talked to my brother. They couldn't talk to me. Like I wasn't. I wasn't really aware. They didn't talk to me. Like I had the attention span of a goldfish. They told my brother, either he's eating now, or we have to. I don't know the medical term, but there is a way to you know get calories in through this. Do you know the term of it? It's a tube, know. a feeding tube. Yeah, a feeding tube. But it's like obviously a pretty invasive type of thing. To yeah, 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 yeah. Not comfortable. Not comfortable. They say it's not nice. It's not. N if he can eat, eat. I'm like, I don't want to eat. I'm throwing everything up. I don't want to eat. So, so my brother was like, you have two choices, this or that. What are you going for? I'm like, well, give me the freaking food. I'll start eating. And I started eating. And as, as soon as, as I would get nauseous, I would tell them I'm getting nauseous. They gave me something so that I don't throw up. I'm like, okay, beautiful. And every day I ate a little bit more. Um, did they want to change the way that you ate or did you just eat every, anything and everything then? <laughs> like, I mean, just to create some context is, here, you went into this eating a whole food plant-based diet. Yeah, I've been vegan for eight years. Um, I went into it eating, you know, mainly whole foods and um, mainly organic, like, uh, but it's a hospital, right? So I didn't have high standards. And remember that one moment where a nurse came in, she brought me the food and she would say, you know, it would be much easier if you just go vegetarian for that time. I'm like, yeah, but I don't care. I find it a bit rude to say that, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> and I had amazing people around me who would bring me food, the food that I want. Like people in Berlin, I would just text them. They would literally ask me, Axel, what do you want to eat? I'll cook every day for you and I bring you food. And I had this very specific diet. They'd wanted me to avoid nuts, um, raw veggies, raw fruits, none of it. Like everything had to be cooked or either with a peel so that I, that we decrease the risk of an infection. But I basically had a team of, of cooks. I said what I wanted to eat and they brought me what I wanted to eat. I got so much better once I started, we call it um, Fafakuchen. Uh, it's pancakes. It's what not do you a weird word. We call it Fafakuchen. Only my community will understand it. At some point, Mari started German. speaking German. Yeah, Pfannkuchen in German. Um, and Mari tried to say that and she called it Fafakuchen. So uh, she started bringing me pancakes with berries. She would cook the berries and plant yogurt. And as soon as I started eating that, I got so much better, so much stronger. <laughs> the next day, I doubled the uh, duration of my, my walk. I'm like, yes, that's what I needed. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so they asked to to change it, but there was also like one doctor who's vegan as well, and she's like, I'll keep doing that. I like that. And I don't know if it was the whole food plant-based diet, but um, round two, round three, round four, I was able to eat the whole time. Like I gained weight. I gained 15 kilograms. You're You're an outpatient at that stage so you're like you're able to get treatment in the hospital and go home or are you yeah staying? for a couple of days yeah yeah and then back to the hospital next round when i whenever i got chemotherapy which was high dose chemotherapy um i had to be like that, that was a procedure in itself like it was a, i don't know how they did that but it was a miracle did you meet many other 
people. I know this was during COVID, so it may may have been a different set of circumstances. But did you were you able to meet and have conversations with anyone else going through? A couple of people, but not many, because it was COVID and also people who go through cancer treatment usually have um, low immunity, so you try to stay away from other people. So it was pretty isolated. Most of the time I was by myself. Yeah. At what point, I have to imagine there was a point where doctors said, Axel, you're in the clear. We got on top of this. We did it. You did it. Mm-hmm. One, most of them don't do that, which I understand. Because then if something happens, you're like, hey, you told me. But one of them, like I... I was begging them. I was like asking them, please tell me, will I survive this? I remember the moments, you know, they came in. I'm like, what am I? Like, I want to hear numbers. I want to have hope. Tell me. And one moment he's like, if you survive the first round, you'll be fine. That's reassuring. And a nurse came in, I remember, and she was really like, like feminine, loving heart. I'm like, do you think I can? I remember asking her. That was week one, like uh, round one. I was like, do you think I can have kids? And she's like, yes. I didn't know her. But she was so loving and caring. She's like, you got this. Just hearing that from a pure stranger, like did something. I wish I could send her a love letter and say thank you. But I don't know what she looks like. (laughs) Too much morphine. (laughs) Also, you know, everybody was wearing masks and like protective things. I'm like, yeah. Thank you. You might be able to find out in the record somehow. I'd love to. I think she, I, who knows, maybe she's watching it. But those nurses, those are heroes. Having kids, that's a discussion that a lot of people that go through chemotherapy, that's something that people would be grappling with. There may be people listening that have gone through similar. Explain what chemotherapy means or or may mean from a fertility point of view, building a family? So obviously I have to say I'm not an oncologist, so obviously double check. And I appreciate this question is... Yeah, no, 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 I have no... um, Forgive me if it's a little intrusive. No, 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 I forgive you. (laughs) You told me me everything. Yeah, yeah, go for it, go for (laughs) it. You're my favorite Australian with your share. (laughs) Usually, I would say, most cases, you have a bit of time to prepare those kind of things. You can, especially if you're a bit younger and you still want to have kids, you can, you know, um, we live in a time with, where we advance in terms of, you know, you can freeze your um, eggs, sperm, and prepare for those kind of things, and it's okay. Um, and you can have kids. Actually, there's a beautiful... Do you know Eamon and Beck? They have yes. Been, no, yeah, no. Yeah, I, you know I don't, I've never met them, so, but we have had some dialogue back and forth. Yes. Lovely people. Um, they actually sent me a video when I, got, when I got the diagnosis and I shared it on social media. They sent me a video and it meant so much to me. And back a couple of weeks later, I got diagnosed with breast cancer. And we would send each other like quotes and we would send each other, send each other messages while we, because we went through chemotherapy together like at the same time. And um, I saw her journey, journey and she, you know, froze her, do you call it egg? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, she froze her eggs and seeing now them being pregnant and stuff on social media means the freaking world to me. Like it's so beautiful, beautiful to see. And I like to look at those kind of stories, like success stories, like beautiful. Um, and in my case, it's, they told me about like, hey, this is chemotherapy. This is, this is what we think will happen. Um, we would like to freeze your sperm in case you want to have kids. And I was like, yeah, I want to have kids. I want to have a f- whole freaking football team. <laughs> <laughs> so chemotherapy obviously um, attacks, attacks bad cells. Let's just call them bad cells for now, but also good cells, cells you don't want to be attacked and that influences your, impacts your fertil- fertility that's why you you know try to freeze your eggs or your sperm um and so they were like we got to do this and at that that was when it was the worst when i felt so sick 
when I couldn't eat, where I was just throwing up all the time. And so we tried, but it didn't work out, surprisingly. Like, you, have, you feel like you're dying. You haven't eaten for weeks. Try to have an orgasm. It's not really a priority. And um, try to do it by yourself in a hospital room. Having. So I had the catheter. They removed the catheter. And now you have a couple of hours window before we have to insert that thing again. I still can't get my head around the time scale, how quickly this occurred. Yeah. This well, is like I, three weeks after you're, you're in weeks. the gym, yeah. had Happy, never even heard healthy. of leukemia. Yeah. I didn't know what that was. Burkitt, lymphoma, what the heck? I don't know. Like, I thought I'm, I'm healthy, I'm untouchable. Like, I didn't ever think about that. I could get sick. Um, yeah, and I tried, didn't work out. Remember telling Mari about it, and she's like, you know what? We'll figure it out. Worst case, we adopt. I'm like, what a woman. Yeah, and I mean, we kind of, we say worst case, but. You don't know. I, hey, until now, hey, could I've be never been, I, I never tested it. So long story short, like it didn't work out. I couldn't freeze it. Um, but I don't know. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I, for a long time, that was one of, again, if you would be a fly in my head, that was really important to me. And it was like, will I ever be able to have kids? Will I ever have to, will I ever be able to have my own family? And um, I worked on this, I worked through this and my answer is yes. I don't know in what form, but I will. If it means that I get to adopt kids, if that's whoever, like I believe, I'm not the most religious person, but I, but I believe in somewhat of a higher power universe, someone who protects me, if I'm supposed to have kids in that way, so be it. And it's going to be pleasurable and fun. And it's much more empowering to, than to say like, okay, I can't have kids. Again, between stimulus and response, there is a space. I could say like, all right, I can't have a family because of that. Or, well, maybe have a, bif a different kind of family and give kids a chance. And I always wanted to adopt. Give kids a chance to have a beautiful life and take care of them. And if that's the form, so be it. I feel like this is just our first conversation. I hope so. Because we're kind of just dipping our toes into your story and really just like a reminder of the fragility of life. Yeah, so precious. And, and getting clear on what matters most. And hope, inspiration. You know, I, I read the comments of people uh, on some of those videos you've put up. And there is a tremendous amount of hope that people are, are are receiving through your story. So thank you for sharing so openly. <laughs> uh, leave Leave someone with some thoughts here that maybe right now is in a space where they think, you know, everything is happening to them. They haven't been able to reframe it as, as for them. They, they feel like they have a lot of problems in their life and perhaps don't have a lot of hope. Yeah. A couple of thoughts. First thought would be, even if life is really hard at the moment, I'd like to ask you, what is good about your life in that moment? What is good in that situation? And what's wrong, what's bad is always available. And what's good is also always available. We went through chemotherapy. I went through chemotherapy with Mari. And she would ask, we would ask each other, what is one thing we can do today that is fun? What is good about right now? Oh my gosh, we have time for each other. She always said, she always, she always wants me to, you know, just chill. Oh, she wanted me to chill and watch Netflix and stuff. And all of, this all of the time we had time to do that. How beautiful is that, right? And she, they needed to, like my family needed to cheer me up because it was a hard time. So just that, that one thing, one thing every day. 
what is good about right now? What is good about this moment? And if I think back, like I could have thought about a lot of things. The people in my life, my brother, that connection, all the people who support me. And I wish I could see the faces of the people who are listening right now. I, you, the person listening knows there is something. There is some kind of beauty in that moment. Focus on that. That's all you, that's all, like, when you go through a terrible time, it's going to be terrible. And I'm not, like, delusional, it's all roses, all butterflies and sunshine. No, it's terrible. It's, it hurts. Like, winter can be tough. But can you find a way to make winter more enjoyable, to play in the snow? And then spring is coming at some point. Like, no winter is forever. At some point, spring is coming. You can almost count on it. You know, every year you have a winter and then a spring is coming. So knowing that, this pain is just temporary. And at some point, this difficulty will lead to opportunity if you let it. Difficulties are usually followed by opportunities. I wouldn't be sitting here with you, I think, right now in this moment, and I'm having the time of my life, if this would have not happened. My life wouldn't be so good right now if this thing didn't happen. Back then in the moment, it was hard to hear, but people told me, hey, it's like, Axel, it's just, I remember my brother telling me, and I told him, like, I'm, I'm scared of dying. He looked me in the eyes, he's like, Axel, it's going to be six months of your life, of your very long, beautiful life. It's just six months. It's temporary. It's going to be okay. So knowing the message that I have for every listener is spring is always following winter without exception. What a beautiful place to end this. Thank you so much for joining us, Axel. Thank you. Thank for, you for sharing. Yeah. Um, Love to have you back on. I'd love to. We're working on a b book, so can't wait to share that with the world. Right when, when do you expect that to be this finished? This year. Okay. I'll send it to you. Yeah. I will read it. I'll share it. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people uh, find you? I mean, I definitely want Paddle everyone court. to go. <laughs> <laughs> We've been having some good games. Right? <laughs> I was surprised about how good you are and how fast. But, yeah, you know. Back in school, I could always sprint. I wasn't great with endurance, but I think I surprised you getting to a couple of those balls. Yeah, I was like, wow, that guy's fast. <laughs> um, so we'll send people to Instagram. Yeah. They have to go there and check out some of these reels to really uh, get a feel. One for minutes. this journey that yeah that and also on. for your community everybody who wants to try meditation breath work we t talked about this plays a big role in my life everybody who uh, comes from your community gets three months completely for free no charge whatsoever out of my membership you find like guided breath work sessions guided meditations life events i'm really into like offline events as well if they just send us the keyword simon three months can there obviously cancel anytime Amazing. we're very um, grateful for that of course have a podcast as well. So we've got a podcast. We'll link to the podcast. We'll link to the socials, website where you can sign up yeah. for the three yeah. months. You can also just DM us, Simon. Yeah. And everything will be in the show notes. Wonderful. Thanks, Axel. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode. Marvelous. <laughs>